If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. Welcome one and all. You are watching the Midnight Ride and thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. It is our pleasure to do this and we're so grateful to have you guys here with us tonight. Uh, this episode is a very special episode because we're going to be covering parts of the Book of Enoch uh, that we normally only ever cover on our nystv.org website through our Book of Enoch video commentary. And the Book of Enoch video commentary is something that we've started in chapter one, and we're all the way to chapter 52. So this is going to go give you guys insight uh, quite a bit into what we're doing here. And so if you guys like this episode that you see tonight, make sure you hit the like button, make sure you share, make sure you subscribe, and go check out nystv.org, and you can get your first month free to see if it's something you enjoy by using the code RIDER, R-I-D-E-R, -E all caps. Uh, you guys sit back, enjoy it tonight, and if you're in the chat, tell us where you're from. If you're uh, in the comment section, you're watching this later, tell us where you're from. We'd love to hear that. Thank you guys so much, and enjoy. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. What's up, David? How are you? Well, I'm excited once again to be here for the Enoch commentary. We're, we're 52 chapters in, and Enoch chapter 52 is just off the charts neat. And what Enoch will do, it will push your envelope. It will push you to realms that you've not gone to before in your thinking and in your spiritual experience. And Enoch chapter 52 uh, it's a paradigm buster, so we're really looking forward to taking y'all into Enoch chapter 52. We sure are, and David, I've got this PowerPoint whenever you're ready to go. All right, Enoch chapter 52, which I entitled The Metal Mountains of Yah, Enoch 52 and 1. And after those days, in that place where I had seen all the visions of that which is hidden, for I had been carried off in a whirlwind, and they had borne me toward the west. Now, the whirlwind is something we've talked about before in our Enoch commentary, 
and whirlwinds in the book of Enoch and in scripture, they are portals. And you can actually hear the sound of the whirlwind. Some people that spend uh, a lot of time in prayer and intercession, they understand the sounds of heaven, that there are things that can actually be heard in the spirit realm as well as seen. And these whirlwinds are an indication that a portal is opening between the first and the second or the first and the third heaven. Uh, wormholes might be a, another way by which we could understand it. And let's look at this in Scripture. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof is the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And as I read this, I can just see this in uh, in my mind uh, that you could just see like you see a storm approaching and you could just see this coming the whirlwind coming fire mm. in the middle of it it's an awesome thing that Ezekiel is describing and this whirlwind this is a portal if you will that has come from the third heaven to the first and the Lord Jesus Christ himself in a theophany is about to appear to Ezekiel and in, we'll read some more text here, beginning in the 14th verse of Ezekiel 1. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel. Now, I want to comment on this word wheel. And in the Hebrew, that's the word ophan. And in the book of Enoch, we're going to see that this is actually another spiritual or I will call it a celestial being. The Ophanim are listed. They're here in the in the King James Bible. It's translated wheel, and we get amplification of this in the book of Enoch. And what we're looking at here, and I'll read the rest of the text. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. I kind of see this maybe as kind of a gyroscope type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in verse 18 it says, And for their rings they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Now, this is just amazing. And we, we really just can't know everything about every little thing. But what it almost appears like to me is that we, we, we have literally... It's like a throne comes down, and there's these four cherubim, and these ophanim. It's almost like we have something here that's part machine and part celestial mm -hmm. being that is carrying these uh, these living creatures. Yeah. And we have ophanim, and we have rings. It's like these uh, celestial beings are actually running this machine. Mm. That's what, I mean, you know, you think about it, too, like our technology today. First off, to people a few hundred years ago, is is supernatural. It's like this would be magic if I'm looking at my, if I if I go back in the times of, uh, I don't know, let's say the 1400s, and I bring my cell phone with me, and I look at my phone, and I start talking to somebody, or I start videotaping my face, or I have somebody else talking to me. What do you think in the 1400s? I Man, that guy's got a magic mirror. That guy is a a magic mirror. Now we're we're ahead in 2021. Now where uh, technology is becoming more and more supernatural, and of course we think of it as natural because that's how we're conditioned to do. But I think we've uncovered and proven that a lot of the technology we have is actually supernatural knowledge that we're not supposed to have. That was passed on by fallen entities, as said in Enoch. 
uh, chapter six and chapter and chapter chapter six and also Genesis chapter six. Yep. Back you know back then it'd be easy to see that and think well, this is this is magic. Today we don't think it of it as magic, but in a way it actually kind of is. And today we're now having conversations because it is capable and it has even been done to where people can interact with the World Wide Web just yep. through their mind. Mm-hmm. And this is a possibility. And this is what it looks like is happening. These old phonum are running this machine. Now, how all that works, we don't know. It's a, This is from the good side of things. The yeah. the godly old phonum and the godly cherubim are transporting uh, porting Christ to appear to Ezekiel through this wormhole or this whirlwind. But on the dark side of things, the fallen angels, and there's discussions in the UFO community, well, are they spiritual or are they tangible? Right. Well, it's both. Yeah. And I think this is exactly what we have when we talk about the fallen angel version of the UFOs. We literally have these fallen entities interacting and running machines, just like these old phonoms are here. Yeah. And that line, that question that they ask is the supernatural or physical, like you said, it's definitely both. And, but where does the line stop at, at some point, the line has to, is going to disappear between sp- uh, spiritual and, and natural because of the way things are progressing. I mean, how, how can we judge now what's supernatural, what's not versus, you know, it, it's just, it's just one of those things. It's like, how do you even judge what is supernatural? I mean, how, how is it not supernatural for us to talk to somebody a thousand miles away on a little yeah. device. How is that not supernatural? Of course we understand it now, but yet it's supernatural at some point in, in history, that would be considered a supernatural way of communicating. Yeah. That's, that's all there is to it. Yeah, it is. And yeah. it's, uh, it's just amazing the point we're at. And always when you hear these UFOs discussed, they're here, then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when we understand this concept of how these things are working, they're they're utilizing wormholes and these whirlwinds. People will hear sounds and they're gone. And uh, at the appearance of the uh, BVM at Medjugorje, uh, these sounds were heard, the sounds of like whirlwinds and buzzing of bees. Mm -hmm. And there's even a a very interesting uh, in scripture there's a tribe of the Raphaim called the Zamzuman mm-hmm. and their name even has a buzz sound to it Zamzuman yeah. but it, it's amazing and this gives us a by looking at what is functioning here on the godly side of the spiritual realm we can get a better understanding of everything in the dark realm is an imitation of that which God does, and he can only duplicate it in an inferior manner. But I think this gives us an understanding of how these things are functioning. Also, you know, all of those, all all of the the dark side of the UFOs or or angels or whatever, from what I understand, just because they were transported, just because they were thrown from heaven, doesn't mean that they lost their powers. Am I, am I am I right in saying that yes, they haven't lost yeah. their powers? So that yeah. we, we we that's why it says to test even even if an angel of heaven comes to you with a different gospel, you know, rebuke yeah. it even because you don't know. You can look at them and you may not even know the difference. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. It's not like one of them's in in nice bright pretty colors and the other one's in red and black and got blood dripping from its eyes. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're they're going to present themselves to you as something good, not something bad, because right. they want to deceive you. Yep. Now, here's one of the many, many places where the book of Enoch, as it begins to give, you know, for God's people in the day of tribulation. Well, here's one of the many places where the book of Enoch gives us insight into scripture, particularly into this uh, text in the book of Ezekiel. And here the Ophanim are listed with the cherubim and the seraphim in what I call celestial beings. They're actually, uh, we could call them angelic. Uh, maybe all in the angel family, but there are higher orders of celestial beings, as I would call them, that are higher than just what would be spoken of in Scripture as angels. And in Enoch 61.10, and he will summon all the host of the heavens and all the holy ones above and the host of God, the cherubic, seraphim, and ophanin, 
and all the angels of power. Now notice here how it breaks it down. These higher order of celestial beings are distinguished from angels. And we see this also in scripture. We see the seraphim, the cherubim, and the ophanim there also as translated wheel in the book of Ezekiel. And, and all the angels of principalities and the elect one and the other powers on the earth and over the water. And this is just amazing. Uh, it talks here about over the water. And I know I have read accounts of uh, riverboat drivers right on the Ohio River, right where we're at here in Tell City, where in the early part of the 1900s, they would report nightly seeing these orbs and these discs mm. right here where we we're at. So it's absolutely amazing. But this is a glimpse into the spiritual world, how it functions. And that glimpse is just going to get clearer as we go on here into Ezekiel uh, 52. Now, here's another good example on Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that they experienced at Pentecost was the sound. They heard the sounds of heaven, and then this was the time when the Holy Ghost came from the third heaven to the first, and they came through the wormhole, if you will, through the, the whirlwind, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Godhead, he came from the third heaven to the first, and this was uh, the, the same thing. They heard the sound of the whirlwind. Now, it's interesting that, uh, it talks about the cloven tongues of fire. Now, I have an idea here that I can't prove. This is just me. Mm -hmm. But I think these might even be uh, spiritual beings themselves, these cloven tongues of fire. I, I kind of had the idea to call them spiritual fireflies, maybe. But look at what the book of Enoch says here. Chapter 14, 8 through 10. And the vision was shown to me thus. Behold, in the vision, clouds invited me, and a mist summoned me, and the course of the stars and the lightning sped and hastened me, and the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward and bore me into heaven. Here we have it again. The winds come and caused him to fly. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And then in verse 9, And I went in till I drew nigh to a wall, which is built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire. Mm. So now Ezekiel is, all, or excuse me, Enoch is also seeing these tongues of fire. And, I be, and it began to affright me. Well, I guess so. Yeah. And I went into the tongues of fire and drew nigh to a large house, which was built of crystals. And the walls of the house were like a tessellated floor made of crystals, and its groundwork was of crystals. Now, it's amazing. Here in the third heaven, Enoch is seeing this crystal palace with the tongues of fire. Now, could this have been the actual place where the Holy Ghost had residence in the third heaven. I don't know, but I cannot get away from this idea that it's very possible that these tongues of fire were even like little spiritual fireflies. But whatever the case, Enoch saw these in this crystal palace in the third heaven. Uh, and it is just to me, just amazing. Well, one thing too, it reminds me of this, uh, um, that, scene reminds me of uh, superman you remember superman where he would go visit the place with krypton or whatever it was and it had this crystal things going on and another question you know when you look at the word cloven for instance cloven tongue means a split tongue or divided tongue that's an interesting concept there like wondering like what what was the significance of it being cloven versus the the regular tongue you know mm -hmm. um interesting anyway so yeah it really is and uh, in the north, we have so much in the north. In the north, Superman had his fortress of solitude. Yes. Made out of ice like yeah. crystal. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so much stuff in the north. Yep. The king of the north. 
yeah. will come against Israel in Daniel 11. And uh, there's definitely was would have had to been something going on there because when you look at all the star forts that we've been looking at all over the all over the map because we've got this thing that shows us every star fort. There was a, a huge amount of star forts facing towards that part of the ocean, which you would think normally in most, who's going to come down from there to attack? Because these are, you know, points of fortress, right, for attacks. But apparently there's something coming from up north there that they were trying to, because the, the majority of them that we saw were on the northern part of Europe up there. There's yeah. tons of them, you know. Could there really be? armies beyond the ice wall that will one day be released i think so i think so too yeah i think so too uh enoch chapter 52 verse 2 there mine eyes saw all the secret things of heaven that shall be a mountain of iron and a mountain of copper and a mountain of silver and a mountain of gold and a mountain of soft metal and a mountain of lead. Now, Enoch here sees these metal mountains. And to get an understanding of what these are, we have a perfect correlation to understand these right in Scripture. Mm -hmm. In Zechariah chapter 6, it says, And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass now we see here in the book of ezekiel the metal mountains or zechariah excuse me the metal mountains and they are launching pads for chariots now what we're really looking at here we're looking at heavenly battlements these are like fortresses uh star forts if you will where there are actually mountains and we're looking at something now in the third heaven. Enoch saw it in the third heaven, and also we see it here in Scripture. And out from the middle of these metal mountains come chariots. Mm -hmm. Now here we have another concept inserted into the spiritual dynamic of spirit horses. And we see spirit horses all through Scripture. Jesus is going to return on a on a spirit horse. In verse 2 it says, In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot, black horses. And we see the four horsemen in the book of Revelation also. But these are different. There's many. Uh, when we think about the spiritual realm, uh, we don't want to think small because it's huge. In verse 3, and in the third chariot, white horses. And in the fourth chariot, grizzled and baked horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? Oh, yeah. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. These are sent out from the third heaven where Jesus stands before the Father. And from these metal mountains in the third heaven, these chariots are going out. The black horses, which are therein, go forth to the north, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go, that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. And of course, this reminds us of the book of Job, where it talks about Satan also going to and fro through the earth, you see. So this is the concept we're looking at. We're looking at heavenly battlements. That's what these metal mountains are. And we see the chariots coming out from between them. Now let's look in the book of Jasher chapter 3, and let's talk a little bit more about spirit horses and how spirit horses connect with the whirlwinds and the chariots. And in the book of Jasher chapter 3, beginning in verse 25, we have the Jasher's comments on the context of the taking up of Enoch. It, and the text says, And now therefore I will teach you wisdom and knowledge and will give you instruction before I leave you how to act upon earth whereby you may live. And he did so. And this is Enoch speaking. And in verse 26 it says, And he taught them wisdom and knowledge 
and gave them instruction, and he reproved them, and he placed before them statutes and judgments to do upon earth. And he made peace amongst them, and he taught them everlasting life, and dwelt with them some time, teaching them all these things. And at the time the sons of men were with Enoch, and Enoch was speaking to them, and they lifted up their eyes and the likeness of a great horse descended from heaven and the horse paced in the air now this is just too much isn't it yeah. i mean what we see here enoch getting ready to be taken up and it's like his ride shows up we have this horse that appears in the heaven and it's like pacing in the air in the heavenly realm now let's just and this made me think in the book of matthew 24 it talks about the sign of the Son of Man. Mm. And Jesus is going to return upon a white horse. And the sign of Enoch being getting ready to be translated, this spirit horse appears in the heavens and was pacing in the air. Could it be that the sign of the Son of Man will be for those that have ears to hear and eyes to see that this spirit horse will pace in heaven as the sign of the Son of Man before he returns? That's an interesting thought. You know, when I when I start thinking, too, about these spirit horses dying in with the revelation, the four horsemen that ride uh, to bring certain things, because the colors are the same. You know, you have the same colors, and we've talked about that. You had, well, I think we did a show, and you've probably done several shows, but we did one in the Book of Enoch about the spirit horses uh, that ride. And it makes you wonder. You see all the – now when I look back and I think about some of the movies I've seen, then you have the, the black horseman that goes through – the earth you know traveling through the earth alone the lone horseman that goes traveling through the earth and is the, you know killing people and the best gunman you know you have all of these oh, yeah. these ideas of like the the headless horseman that rides and and all of these um myths or, or no, maybe not myths but these shows that talk about these lone horsemen that kind of go through the earth making war and doing their certain things and, and really just almost supernatural in the way that they describe them it makes you wonder if that's not kind of what they're trying to play on you know i don't know Maybe exactly. Not. I think it's exactly it. And these concepts, sad to say, they're understood much more by the people on the dark side than the people on the side of the children of light. Yeah. Uh, we have been too slow and too fearful. We're taught to fear the supernatural realm. And certainly if you're not in Christ, you should be afraid. But faith in christ is supernatural yeah it gives a supernatural new birth it imparts to us supernatural gifts of the spirit it gives us the ability to understand spiritual things in the scripture and we don't need to be afraid of the supernatural the father he wants to pour out upon us blessings we have been blessed with him with all blessings in spiritual places ephesians 1 and 3 says and in uh, in verse 28 here it says and they told enoch what they had seen and enoch said to them on my account does this horse descend upon the earth the time has come when i must go from you and i shall no more be seen by you hmm. and enoch understood that when the this was his ride you know his ride was showing up and it was time for him to go and we did a midnight ride and i think we're going to hopefully be able to redo this with Dan Badandi on his show about the translation of Enoch in the north. And we're not reading these texts today, but in the book of Jasher, it goes in to the, the, the text. It shows Enoch journeying to the north, and we tied this in with Mount Meru. It was really quite the ride, and mm. we're going to even try to redo, or, you know, Dan Badandi wants to interview uh, us on that hopefully we can do that but yeah well, hopefully amazing. hopefully you said something about maybe going on next week and doing it so that'd be awesome so. now in jasher chapter 3 and verse 32 it says and it was after this that he rose up and rode upon the horse now enoch actually gets on this horse and rides now this makes me think you know and we think well boy a lot of people here they just mm -hmm check out at this point this is too much but think in the scripture the ethiopian eunuch he was there in acts i think it was the eighth chapter and then he was just gone and transported somewhere else just mm -hmm. like that could he have rode a spirit horse went through a wormhole i don't know but we know what the scripture says he was there 
then he was gone and he was somewhere else just like that well american airlines wasn't around back then neither was you yeah know, spirit air or anything like that it was spirit horse air <laughs> yeah he was flying uh, yahweh airlines <laughs> first class yeah and it was after this that he rose up and rode upon the horse and he went forth from all the sons of men and and all the sons of men went after him, about 800,000 men, and they went with him one day's journey. Now, this was a huge event, and uh, we're going to leave the text here in the book of Jasher at this point. If we would go on, it talks about journeying into the north of the place of ice and the ice mountains and all that. It's really amazing. Yeah, we but, talked about that, David. That was on, I think that was on our portals uh, show that we did on the Midnight Ride. We went over all of those scriptures about him going to the ice and yeah. the men not make, you know, not making it in the end. It was too cold yeah. or whatever. They actually tried. They went there and probably died there. But we talked about that in the portal show. That was a really good show. Yeah, and it very much ties in with these concepts of the north, the ice wall, Matt Meru, these portals. Mm -hmm. uh, all It's just fascinating stuff. But we're going to go a different direction in our text in Jasher today. And uh, in verse 36 of Jasher chapter 3, and it says, When the kings returned and caused a census to be taken in order to know the number of remaining men that went with Enoch, and it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. So we see how intertwined these things are, the whirlwind and the spirit horses and the chariots of fire. And when whirlwinds open, they're a portal between the first heaven and the second or the third, or maybe even between somewhere else here in the first heaven. You go in a whirlwind from here to somewhere else. It is actually possible that in the last days, we're going to see some of God's people just translated. Mm. You know, we get in a tough spot. You know, we could just do a whirlwind on them. I mean, this if we believe Scripture, and we do, uh, this is exactly what we see with, uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch. And it says, and you know, we've got the whirlwind and the horses and the chariots. These are means of transport people through the whirlwind the spirit horses and the chariots of fire we we also confirm this in scripture it talks about elijah being taken up in the whirlwind now it's it, something too david i want to point out too sure. that this is, is another rabbit hole to go down here but it says in um three the one you right before at three um 32 that there were eight hundred thousand men that followed after enoch here okay so not too long after Enoch, we have the great flood. I wonder what happened to all 800,000 of these people. I know some of them didn't make it, obviously, and didn't go all the way. But what happened to those 800,000 men that were following after what Enoch was saying and listening uh, to this message that he had? What happened to them? Did they backslide? Did they die? Did You know, what happened? Yeah, that's what I wonder. Like, why weren't they on the ark kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And this seems to be the way. Whenever there's a strong leader, uh, like after Moses and Joshua, when Joshua died, they went into apostasy. Yeah. All through the book of Judges, there's a judge raised up that leads them to repentance and victory. Mm -hmm. Then they go right back into the sewer in apostasy. And this seems to be the way, and this seems to be what happened here with Enoch. He was tremendously received uh, as a great teacher. He taught them things of God's law and God's truth. Big following, but it's a great question. Where were they when the rain started? They and, lost uh, their hero, it seems like, and then so they went from that just to doing their own thing. That's It's, it's amazing that that concept because you, you're right. The judges, they would there really literally only be one or two people that actually cared anything about really following God, it seemed like, in any given time. Yeah. And the rest of the people were always just getting – you know, chastised for not doing it. It seemed like it was always just a few people. And it's always going to be that way, I'm sure. You know, if you really think about the way is narrow, if you find yeah, it. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. So, And how prone we are as fallen human beings to want to follow men, hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, that is a huge lesson for us. That's the worst, uh, worth the price of admission of yeah. this evening, if for nothing else. Now, Let's think a little bit about spiritual mountains, and we're going to think uh, about just exactly 
or at least to get an idea how this works. But in Isaiah chapter 2, it says the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Now, what we're talking about here is not a mountain in the first heaven. We are talking about the heavenly Jerusalem where the Lord will really be exalted and draw people unto him in the last days. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And from these uh, mountains in the third heaven, these are the places where the Father, these are heavenly battlements. In Psalm 18.10, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. He did fly upon the wings of the wind. And this is how the Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost all move from the third into the first heaven through these uh, through the whirlwinds, the chariots, the cherubims. And in Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Mm -hmm. And there are thousands of these. We're talking about uh, the power of the almighty God that has these metal mountains in the third heaven thousands and thousands of chariots here that can be released when uh, the Father wants to unleash his power. Amazing power that the Father has here. And that's what we're looking at here in these metal mountains. We're looking at heavenly battlements, if you will, heavenly star forts. It's starting to sound a lot like Star Wars, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it really and, is. Uh, and this is a real picture of what we're seeing in the spiritual realm. Now, let's get back to Enoch 52, and we'll understand the metal mountains that Enoch was seeing. And it says, And I asked the angel who went with me, saying, What things are these which I have seen in secret? And he said unto me, All these things which thou hast seen shall serve the dominion of his anointed that he may be potent and mighty on the earth you see these wow. are the things that are going to serve the father that makes him potent and mighty you see these are the awesome uh, resources of power that the father has now in 52 5 it says and that angel of peace answered saying unto me wait a little and there, and there shall be revealed unto thee all the secret things which surround the Lord of Spirits, like there was more Enoch needed to see. It's just amazing. But we have here an interesting uh, mention here of an angel in verse 5 called the Angel of Peace. Now, with all Enoch was seeing, he needed an angel to keep him calm. <laughs> You know, there was places where he just freaked out. Oh, yeah, and you could imagine somebody actually seeing these things. Now, this angel of peace is mentioned again in Enoch chapter 40 and verse 8. And after, after that, I asked the angel of peace who went with me, who showed me everything that is hidden. Who are these four presences which I have seen and whose words I have heard and written down? And this angel of peace was like an angelic guide and protector of Enoch on all of his journeys. This angel of peace, we don't really know um, who he was. Uh, he's the angel of peace. And he was with Enoch through this whole experience. He explained things to him. He protected him and kept him calm from absolutely flipping out through the whole thing. And uh, it's interesting. And this is the same thing we see here in the book of Revelation. Uh, we see John all through the book of Revelation, the angel explaining things to him. And we see it here in verse 1, the way that the revelation was given to the apostle John, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So it's the revelation of the person of Jesus. In chapter 1, 
he had the vision of Jesus, his eyes like flaming fire, his feet were even like burning brass. What a visual. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to shew unto his servants that which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So we see the same thing with the apostle John in the book of Revelation. There was this angel that was given as a companion on his journeys to help explain things to him. Hmm. Because when we get to this level of revelation, like the apostle John experienced in Enoch, uh, the Lord sent along a little heavenly uh, companion and guide through that, the angel of peace. And we see this another amazing concept here. Hmm. Now, in Enoch chapter 52 and verse 6, we learn something else here important. It says, And these mountains which thine eyes have seen, the mountain of iron, and the mountain of copper, and the mountain of silver, and the mountain of gold, and the mountain of soft metal, and the mountain of lead, all these shall be in the presence of the elect one, as wax before the fire, and like the water which streams down from above upon these mountains, and they shall become powerless before his feet. Now we learn something about these metal mountains in Enoch. They are not the good mountains. These are the battlements of the fallen angels that Enoch is seeing here. They are the imitation of the metal mountains of Yah. And here Enoch is told that all of these mountains of the uh, fallen ones, they're just going to melt and the Father is going to destroy them. And by when we can understand how the true spiritual kingdom works, we can understand everything that is done on the dark side. It's just an imitation in an inferior way of that which the Father does. Mm. It's an interesting thought to think, too. Maybe, you know, a lot of the metals, the reason people find them so precious and use them so much is possibly because the metals were brought here by an outside source is a, is a you know, interesting thought. And we could also talk, and another whole area that we could expand is you can look at uh, the book of the prophet Daniel, chapter 2. We had the four metal kingdoms, yes. yeah. which were empowered by the metal mountains from the 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 third heaven. So there's more, you see, and this will help us understand more here uh, as we go on into some other things. Now, wow. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Now, this is talking about a lot more than movement of pile of dirt. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Hmm. Now, this is more than just uh, thinking about moving dirt from one side of the yard to the other, but this is actually a powerful spiritual warfare scripture where we can actually wage war on these metal mountains that are actually launching attacks on us. The, the book of Enoch said they're going to melt, and it's nothing is impossible unto us for us to be able to deal with things spiritually in the spiritual realm. Very cool concept there, David. Yeah, and we could, see, we could go on another um, a bunny trail here, all oh, yeah. of the mountains in the book of Revelation, the sure. mountains, the seven mountains that yeah. the horse sits on. Yeah. It, 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 this is a spiritual concept that just unfolds and rolls all throughout. We've had, we've had about five lessons we could have done just yeah. from this one chapter. There's so much here, but Oh, you look at the ages too, you know, the golden age, the iron age and all yeah. that. It's just, it's like, are these divisions of these Ofana or these divisions of these chariots that decided this is their time to reign on earth or how does that work? You know, I, I think that's the basic concept yeah. behind this. I really do. Uh, in Colossians chapter one, verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones 
or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created for him and by him. And it speaks of these thrones and thrones here again. These are more, we're talking more than just a physical chair you sit on. These thrones are actually spiritual entities that are ruling in the dark realm. And this is a part of the fallen hierarchy. And we see in Ephesians 6.12, we know the scripture, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that word high places that appears five or six times in the book of Ephesians, one is in one and three, where it says we are blessed in heavenly places. And it's clarified, I think in verse 20, that this is at the very right hand of God. We're talking third heaven stuff. This is where we wrestle. And these are thrones. And in these, you see, in this kingdom, there are thrones of fallen angels with mountains of battlements where they are actually launching these things that now mankind perceives of them as UFOs. And we see all of this escalation going on. And, uh, you know, where this stops, I think we might know. Uh, we've talked about this. We did uh, not long ago. Uh, you did a very good midnight ride on the UFO disclosure. It's all over the news. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing, we're seeing the dark forces ramp up their battlements. And they're more and more bold coming into the first heaven here. And, uh, you know, this is coming to the showdown of the Yahweh Corral. You, you know, it's, it reminds me of something. You know, we talked about doing war in battle places while we're physically here. But our, it's like our spirit's hidden somewhere there and it does talk about the hidden ones you know and this is an interesting thought to me because in the occult for instance they have these rituals where they try to divide their self up over different amulets or something like that to different tokens or yeah. whatever to where they can't kill them they can't they, they can't kill if they kill you here you're still alive in one of these other spots you know they yeah. they try to duplicate yeah. that idea uh which is just really interesting i think one of the most uh remembered Hollywood flick that that teaches this concept is Harry Potter in which Voldemort I think is his name Voldemort divides himself over seven like runes or something along those lines and in order to kill him you have to kill all of the things he's divided himself up into yeah. and it just it just makes you think like this is this is their thought behind this this is what they this is their whole idea so yeah. interesting and also in the occult when they make their amulets and their sigils, the kind of metal it's made out of is important to them. Yeah. It's got to be a certain kind of metal. Well, yeah. that's because this is corresponding to things in the spiritual realm of yeah. the metal mountain. There's, there's a real correlation here that we can understand. And I think perhaps Daniel 1138, after this discussion, could be a little more understandable to us. Yeah. And it talks about the willful king. And it says, but in his estate shall he honor the god of forces now you look up any good commentary on this that word it means the god of fortresses mm. we're talking about the he honors the god of these dark heavenly battlements in the third heaven because mm. this guy has figured out where the power's at yeah. he has figured out how to tap in to these demonic star forts if you will but in his estate shall he honor the god of forces speaking about the willful king that i believe will soon invade israel i believe this will be uh, one of the leaders of iran which we also we've talked about this in midnight rides and in his but in his estate he shall honor the god of forces and a god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones. He honors them with metal. Yeah. You know, how's he going to honor the God of the fortresses of the metal mountains? Well, how else but with metal? Yeah. Look at that. And could this be why they're trying to gather so much of these metals? Like, because is this why gold's worth so much? Is this why silver, they're trying to gather it all up and buy it all up? Is this why? You yeah, know, to give it back to these this entity of sorts. Oh uh, yeah, I mean yeah. this is just amazing, isn't it? But uh, he shall honor with gold and silver, precious stones and pleasant things. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. There are, there's concepts here in the spirit 
uh, and the spiritual realm that are huge. Mm -hmm. And as we conclude uh, Enoch chapter 52, uh, it, it says this, And it shall come to pass in those days that none shall be saved either by gold or by silver, and none shall be able to escape. People that are looking to the dark realm, and there is power there. There is no doubt that there's power in the dark side, but those that are looking to these things, and gold and silver here could mean a lot more than just saving up your money. Yeah. Uh, it could be the gold and silver that's offered up to the God of forces in manipulating of the power of the metal mountains. In verse 8 it says, And there shall be no iron for war. And here again, that might mean more than just what we think here on the surface of, of the first reading. Nor shall one clothe oneself with a breastplate. Bronze shall be of no service, and tin shall be of no service and shall not be esteemed, and lead shall not be desired. Mm. And all these things shall be denied and destroyed from the surface of the earth. Now, this is an amazing statement. Metals are going to be destroyed from the earth because yeah. these are being used by the dark powers in the metal mountains. That's amazing. When the elect one shall appear before the face of the Lord's spirits. It's interesting. You know, when you think about that in... And the idea that we talked about before, maybe these metals were put here by outside forces. And that's why God's decided, you know, because, I mean, you get rid of all the metals and all these different things. You have no more weapons. First off, you know, what do you make knives and guns out of iron, steel, stuff like that gold? You don't have any more like that greed that comes with the gold. You know, when you look at look at the movies, there's always the greed tied with the golden ring or the golden thing. And silver and all of these different things. It's interesting, man. A lot of bad things have come out of those things. As much, much good things have come out of them, I think more bad have come out of iron, steel, you know, all of these things. Oh, you bet. That have yeah. been the weapons by which mankind have slaughtered one another. Yeah. And uh, you can go back to Enoch chapter 6, and it talks about the fallen angels revealing unto mankind the the workings of these things so yeah that's a just a compelling thought and in enoch 52 for just something that just will explode your mind and open up avenues to you that are just amazing enoch 52 here is hard to beat yeah so we just really um we just thank each and every one of you that are not afraid to join us in pushing the envelope and letting the Holy Spirit revealing things unto us that uh, are going to be very, very helpful to us in the last days. Mm -hmm.